Yamashita. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Well, I hope that the, everybody is uh, happy coming back to this final session. Uh, this is um, actually the last session, and yet the least. We have a very, very distinguished panelist over here on this podium. Well, um, the, if you recall, in this, this morning's uh, keynote, there were several uh, points uh, listed or pointed out. The very important one is that the future innovation will be required, be, well, judging from the mega trends we are observing. If I were to mention a few key words, there are rise of individuals, new society and economy, such as urbanization, uh, aging society, growing demand, sustainability, more individual solutions than centralized system, connectivity, and system integration. Well, they all more or less require interdisciplinary, transsector or cross-cutting system designs and architecture, not only the individual technologies, involving different sectors, different players, including consumers. We used to focus more on the supply-side technologies, but now we also need demand-side technologies, it seems. So there are lots of expectations towards the technology innovations. The question is how to make it happen, how to bring it there. So the, um, I would like to ask each panelist to be punchy, short, and challenging. I hope that we will have a very good discussion and then I hope you will all enjoy and then have some takeaway from this panel. So without waiting too much, uh, I would like to uh, invite the first panelist, Mr. Okada, uh, to make his intervention and then we would construct on the, each panelist's uh, intervention and then, then we try to open up the discussion. So Mr. Okada. Okay. So thank you, thank you very much, Chair, for this opportunity. Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, make a brief uh, self-introduction at the beginning. So I've been working for uh, more than 30 years at the Japanese Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. And actually, uh, I held uh, various positions, including uh, Chief Direct, uh, Executive Director of uh, JETRO, Japan External Trade Organization San Francisco office, where uh, very closely located to the Silicon Valley. And also, uh, I was working for Director of Personnel and Human Resource Department, and as an executive coordinator of collaboration promotion department of National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology of Japan. And also uh, as working for, as international coordinator for environment at the Agency of Natural Resources and Energy. And at this uh, uh, natural laboratory for advanced industrial technology and science and technology, I closely worked on the technology transfer from research activities by the laboratory to development activity and activities and innovations by industries. Uh, reflecting these ex experiences, I'm going to comment on the topic. Uh, first of all, there has always been a huge gap between the technology development itself and its successful develop de deployment to the society. Uh, which is often called Valley of Death. Having said so, uh, nowadays software or information communication related technologies are a lot easier to be commercialized thanks to the so-called cloud or other technology uh, the development platforms. On the other hand, uh, there are still lots of difficulties for advanced technologies to be commercialized in energy spaces uh, due to the strict and high standards for the application, and that needs long-standing uh, uh, operational experience, experiences and the necessity of heavy investments. In a word, uh, the procedure takes long period of time and large amount of money, which could be referred to as barriers. Uh, here exists one of the important laws uh, by the government policy, that is to say, uh, the facilitation of the preparatory process for the commercialization of advanced technologies. Uh, the Japanese government has already initiated large-scale demonstration projects uh, related to smart electric power grid and smart electricity demand supply management. 
in which uh, related entities, including private companies, can experiment and verify their hypotheses on technology and business models. And the other aspect of the government policy is the establishment of appropriate regulatory framework to stimulate the competition in energy space and eventually the widespread develop, deployment of advanced technologies that are mature <coughs> to be economically viable to the market. So Japanese government is now in such a process as for the electric power industry under the already decided schedule and the gas utility industry in the long run as well. So just I'd like to stop here. So, well, thank thank you. you very much for the, uh, sharing the, uh, what Japanese government is uh, doing. Um, actually, I would like to go to the next uh, floor, the uh, Dr. Wozczyk, uh, uh, to um, ask you about the, uh, what you think about uh, being the, uh, um, the project designer uh, for the startup projects for the many, many companies, as well as uh, advising the, the world in Europe. So please, uh, Dr. Wozczyk. Uh, well, so let me, since this needs to be a bit of, of controversial, I believe, based on your direction, mm -hmm. uh, let me make the following statement. Uh, according to Pike Research Institute, uh, by 2016, 2017, uh, the total investment in new technologies, either smart grid related or any type of uh, you know, innovation related, will be at the level of $200 billion. On the other hand, according to Bloomberg, uh, only 60% of total innovation projects, technology related globally, um, or, or over 60% of those uh, projects is still in the R&D and demonstration phase, mm. which means we don't have a, a scale. We are still playing. We are still playing and learning. So I believe technology is not an issue. There's plenty of investment and plenty of technology available today. But I believe where the problem statement is that we truly don't understand why we are deploying a lot of technologies. Let me give you a reference point since we're in Asia. Uh, in Philippines, uh, as Meralco, we serve about 5.4 million customers. 60% of those customers are low social economic group. They cannot afford anything. On the other hand, uh, prices of electricity in, uh, in uh, Philippines uh, compared to, we compete with Singapore and Japan for the most expensive electricity in Asia, which means we are very exp expensive. Therefore, the question is, how do we roll out the technology at desirable scale that is not purely for renewable integration, for more biomass, wind, solar, but how do we roll out the technology as an enabler to more what I call a shirt of wallet spending for the customer, which means empowering middle class in the context of, of Asia. Mm. Technology is just a means. We cannot forget that at the, end of, at the end of the day, everything that we do has to drive economic competitiveness at the country level. For that, we need electricity as a commodity, and for that, we need infrastructure. So customer needs to be in the center of understanding why we are deploying technologies. And in some cases, technology is not an answer. And sometimes we reverse the discussion of saying that we need more technology, more integration, more interconnection, mm -hmm. without truly understanding why we do in the context of our customers. So technology is not a problem, but sometimes our mindset, why we're doing what we're doing in the context of integrating technologies. So uh, what you po your point is that the, how to make the uh, affordable technologies uh, in place, uh, which will serve for the customers? No, my point is how do we make affordable service enabled service. by technology? Uh, that's a okay. completely different story. Okay. So uh, I like the comment from the uh, previous panel. I believe it was a gentleman from Anel when he said we cannot look at the electricity as a, uh, electricity said now becomes a service. It's not an infrastructure per se. It's a service of delivering certain value to our customers, and that's a very important aspect I would like to bring up. Thank you very much. Okay, now I would like to turn to uh, Mr. Schwartz. Um, well, uh, you are known as a scenario planning expert from the shell, but at the same time, you have um, uh, contributed to the many uh, filmmaking as a scenario planner for the film. Uh, like uh, you, you make it visualize uh, for the, the ordinary audience that the understandable future picture, um, not only necessary to the in the energy, but also in the many different science technologies. So what is your view about the innovative technologies to be a, become available for, the, for us all? Uh, thank you. And, and, and thank you for all of you who have managed to hang in here till the very end. You're, you are either, either brave or have no better place to go. I'm not sure which it is. But uh, thank you for staying. Uh, 
what I, I, I want to address very quickly is uh, one fundamental point. Uh, uh, whether we ought to be optimistic or pessimistic about the energy future mm -hmm. in light of the issues of sustainability. Uh, the fundamental sustainability issue, I believe, is the question of carbon dioxide and climate change. You know, if we are able to change that trajectory, that's one future. And if we can't change that trajectory, it's a very different future. And I think that is the biggest challenge our civilization faces. It never has faced anything bigger than this, and our future is fundamentally different depending upon the answer to that question. Oh, no. uh, okay. So what I would say, just to give you the answer at the beginning, and then I'll justify why I think so, is I'm pretty optimistic in the short run, I'm very optimistic in the medium term, and I'm very pessimistic in the long term. So I, if you imagine a curve of rising optimism and then falling, right, that, that's where I am. Because I think, you know, we've got a lot of good things underway at the moment, and I think they will bear a lot of good fruit in the medium term, but we have not got a good long-term answer. So that's, that's basically my argument. So why do I think that? Well, you have to address what are the sustainability levers, what actually drives our sustainability over the short run, medium term, and long run. And, and you know, it, it is many things which we are all very familiar with in energy using technologies, whether it's things like HVAC and lighting and transport, ser services, manufacturing, all of that. And we continue to invest in every one of those arenas to improve the quality of technology on the demand side. Better lighting, better air conditioning, and so on. All of that is worth doing. Another area which has very big lever on which we don't do enough is urban design, the basic shape of our uh, land use, where we put our buildings, how we design our transport systems as regional. We're doing a lot on building design, but we're not doing nearly enough on urban form. And it makes a huge difference. The most important energy policy of the post-war era in the United States had nothing to do with energy. It was the Interstate Highway Act and the FHA Home Loan Program, which created suburbs that you had to drive to and you had to drive everywhere to do anything. You couldn't walk, you couldn't ride. And so the urban designs that are moving toward transit and walk-friendly suburbs are a very different kind of environment. So the kinds of design plans and technology we need in that environment is uh, 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 what the kind of things we need. On the production side, uh, we've again continued to invest quite substantially in uh, how to clean up coal, how to use uh, gas, how to combine natural gas with renewables, uh, imp dramatic improvements in re renewables uh, and in remediation like CCS. Uh, but where we need a lot of new research is a new bio, uh, no bio science, new nuclear power, and new storage. Uh, all of those are getting some attention, but not nearly enough, the big one being so, uh, new storage. The barriers are obvious, the, it's the cost of change. Now, the cost of change is beginning to fall, and the role of the incumbents uh, have to address the question of retrofitting as well as just resisting change. But we have a great example in transport where what we're seeing is that the internal combustion engine is improving dramatically in its efficiency in response to the competition from electric vehicles and hybrids. So that competition, I think, is driving and reducing the barriers. Mm -hmm. I think what we're also seeing, and this is where I get very optimistic, is an enormous scale up of private investment, mostly small, mostly coming out of things like venture capital and so on. And it is creating now a great potential for the medium term. That is, we've built up a big body of knowledge over the last 10, 15 years mm -hmm. that is just beginning to come to the market and we'll have a very big example. And a wonderful example is Nest, a home control system mm -hmm. that no public money went into, private, very low cost, easy to distribute, and will re improve energy efficiency at the household level. Okay. Uh, so I think we're gaining enormous amount of momentum of the investment we have been carrying out over the last 15 years as a result of the expectation of higher prices, as a result of good public policy in a number of places. And we've seen how much of effect for example, energy policy in California has had on reducing electricity consumption enormously. We in California use 70% as much electricity as the rest of the country. Our automotive emissions policies and mileage policies have meant that the United States peaked in oil demand in 2009. That was the peak. So it's not a peak of supply, it's a peak of demand. So all of these you come together of good policy, accumulated weight of uh, all of, uh, uh, of the investment means that we have a number of options that come into play in the medium term. But none of them 
solve the fundamental problem of our civilization in the long run for the need of clean energy that produces no CO2. We're going to use a lot more hydrocarbons for the next 50 years, and no matter what we do, we're going to leave an enormous uh, load of CO2 in the atmosphere. So the challenge, therefore, is to find a long-term source. Maybe it's fusion, maybe it's space solar. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's some form of bioscience, but we do not have the long-term solution. Thank you. Okay, I clearly understood why you are pessimistic about the long term is that you haven't seen the technology which can solve it yet. I haven't even seen the science yet. You haven't seen the science yet. Okay, so uh, we, we have to take that as a takeaway point, I think. Okay, the, I would like to move on. Uh, I would like to introduce the Professor Andrew Blakers. Uh, the, he, you have been uh, developing many kinds of uh, uh, efficient technologies for the solar silicon cells and then they have changed the world um, in that sense. So what is your view about the innovation in the technologies and then what is the pot potential and what have been the barriers? All these questions I have addressed uh, beforehand. Well, I would take exactly the opposite view to my colleague. I would say that we actually do have the technologies required to go to 100% clean energy right now. They can get better, they will get better, but we don't have to invent anything in particular. And they can be summed up in four words, photovoltaics and possibly solar thermal as well, plus wind, plus high voltage DC cables for interconnection, plus uh, pumped hydro energy storage. So going in order, we are looking at the uh, a complete revolution in the energy system of a scale that uh, rivals the introduction of oil back in the last century. Uh, the advent of photovoltaics at low cost really is a game changer, as I think everybody in the PV industry and uh, in many other areas now understands. The fact that photovoltaics can now produce energy at the same price as new built coal or gas is really quite revolutionary. The fact that wind energy continues to get better, that uh, wind energy resources continue to expand as we discover more places to put wind generators uh, is a way of of reaching a supply which is 100% of uh, PV and wind with a, a bit of hydro, a bit of biomass, a bit of geothermal, a bit of other things on top over the next 30 or 40 years. And in, indeed, I think this is the way we will have to go. High voltage DC will be absolutely essential in this energy revolution in order to get continental scale or even intercontinental scale connectivity. And this has a dramatic effect on ameliorating the intermittency of wind and photovoltaics and the other minor renewables. Why, are we, why am I focusing on PV in particular and wind? The simple reason is that the solar resource is truly enormous. The direct beam solar resource is truly enormous. And photovoltaics currently runs at an efficiency of 17, 18% at the module level. Uh, this will increase into the 25 to 30 percent range with uh, existing technology and has the potential to go into the 30 and 40 percent range uh, uh, over the near term future. Of course, the higher the efficiency that is land that is required, when you calculate the amount of land that's required, taking into account the fact that a lot of it will be on rooftops, it's uh, a very affordable uh, method of harvesting energy. And uh, finally, when you go to very high penetrations of PV and wind, uh, you may end up having to do some load balancing through mass storage. There is a mass storage technology that currently comprises 99% of all energy storage. It's 150 years old. That's pumped hydro electricity. Mm. Uh, the sort of pumped hydro that will be in the future is not associated with rivers. It's off-river in hills with an altitude difference between the hill and the valley of 500 to 1,000 metres. And it's very small turkey nest dams at the top and bottom of the hill a few hectare dam can service a load of 1,000 megawatts for four or five hours, which is enough to deal with the day-night problem of photovoltaics and also to deal with wind lulls. The message is the technology is here. It's now, it's nothing particularly to invent, although always further innovation is, is a good thing. It's something that we can roll out. I think it's very instructive to look at what is happening in Australia, where we have a rather hostile government to renewable energy, but the fact is that Australia is very likely to be 80% renewable electricity by 2040 mm. for the very simple reason that uh, no new coal power stations and probably no new gas power stations are going to be constructed in Australia. The existing fleet of fossil fuel power stations will retire mostly over the next 30 years and they are being replaced by PV and wind. PV and wind is 100% of past, present and future 
new electricity in Australia. It's a very large fraction of new energy around the world. In fact, PV Wind Hydro was more than half of new generation capacity around the world last year. So I really think that uh, we are at the cusp of a very large change in energy supply. And on top of that, there's a very uh, large change in the nature of energy supply due to the fact that photovoltaics in particular can be integrated at the customer level. We are looking more like a grid, such as the mobile phone system possesses, instead of the central distribution, typical of the old uh, centralised phone distribution network. We are going to have a very energy system, and it's going to come much faster than a lot of people think. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for the very encouraging information, uh, the series of information, including the Australia's becoming 100% uh, 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 emission-free uh, the energy generator. Okay, turning to the United States. Uh, the Dr. Uh, Majumdar, uh, you have been advising the current government heavily on the energy, uh, situ energy technology uh, the policies. And then the, you uh, back to the Stanford and then the now teaching the uh, students. So what is your insight on the technological innovations in, in, in many items uh, we have already uh, talked about? Well, first of all, let me just thank the organizers of this meeting for bringing us all here. And I also want to sort of comment and compliment the, the tenacity and the commitment of all the people out here to be here at this late hour to listen to us. Um, first of all, let me just step back a little bit from all this, uh, the discussion for the whole day. And I think there are two big problems, mm. the challenges that we have going into the 21st century. <clears throat> One is, I think Peter mentioned this, we have a carbon problem. And the carbon problem has been accumulating since the engines of James Watt, because the lifetime of CO2 molecule is a few hundred years. So not only do we have to develop solutions that take care of today's carbon emissions, we actually have to do so in a way that take care of all the cumulative CO2 molecules that have been emitted. So that's the challenge that we are facing. Just to put that in context, people talk about fossil fuels. The amount of fossil fuels that are there in the Earth is about the same as the amount of oxygen that we have in the atmosphere, because that's where the oxygen came from. So it's not a question of whether we have enough fossil fuel. We have enough. It's a question of economics, of how to extract that. So that's the challenge we have. Now, clearly, we are, we are the bleeding edge of an industrial revolution that started 250 years ago, and it's very hard to turn that around. But if you go as business as usual, we don't have a chance of really addressing the big challenge. Mm -hmm. So that's number one, which means we need innovations in technology because the first industrial revolution was all about technology. Mm -hmm. So we need new technologies to, to turn the ship around. But I would say technology is necessary but not sufficient. We need scale. This problem is at scale, which means we need finance, we need markets, we need other things, services to be delivered to people. After all, all the energies are all about people. So that's one big problem. Mm -hmm. The second big problem was mentioned a little bit earlier in probably the previous panels. We have one and a half billion people without access to electricity, and another one and a half billion people who have very limited access to electricity. Mm. By 2050, there'll be two more billion people added to the same regions where people don't have access to electricity. So almost half the world's population will not have access to electricity, and if you extrapolate the 20th century, the chances are that we may not be able to electrify and provide affordable, accessible electricity to everyone, which I think is really a human right issue. Because if you don't provide access to electricity, we're never, they're never going to get the benefit of all the development that we have had around the world that we enjoy. So those are the two big problems. And clearly, business as usual is not going to make it. So we need innovations. We need, tech, we need science and engineering to provide options. Mm -hmm. Not all the technologies will be used, 
but we need options. We need the scientists and engineers mm -hmm. to work hard to develop options. And then you need the access to long-term, low-cost capital to be able to scale it. And of course, we need the markets. And that's where clever, judicious policies to align all of these in the right way at speed, because we don't have much time. Okay. And that is what we really need in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Well, we are coming back to the old questions of our three E's, uh, three different E's, and then the, uh, we need to um, have the uh, options of the technologies to address that. Well, actually, we moderators are uh, uh, equipped with this uh, pan, uh, the, um, latest technology where we have the uh, questions from the floor. So I'd like to take one question here. But before going to that, as a moderator, we also have uh, this um, obligation to thank the Accenture for co-producing this. Um, it is a very exciting uh, panel, and, and it, it had happened because of the, uh, the Accenture's sponsorship. Okay, we have a very um, uh, high population, high populated question here. I would like to ask all, all uh, panelists to try to answer. Uh, which alternative energy source would be expected to be the next big thing? Well, based on these uh, technological questions we have uh, covered so far, well, we need to look up all the possibilities and, and we need to uh, actually place the uh, time frame, the short term, mid-term and in long term, and yet people would like to know, being in Singapore, uh, which is the next big thing. Uh, so is there anybody who would like to respond to that? Yes, please, Ajit. We have a way of saying this in the U.S., which is now, you know, awash with natural gas. The next big shale revolution is energy efficiency. We are very wasteful in how we use energy because we have plenty. We don't have to worry about carbon. And we, we have to worry about this now. And not to say that we don't need, we need to decarbonize the sources, but it is frankly good for business if it become energy efficient. It's just a smarter way to do business. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else? Yes, uh, so uh, I think there are several answers. I clearly I I agree with Arjun uh, with respect to uh, efficiency, terribly important. But at least there are two or three other areas which are worth paying attention to. I think the one that has the potentially the greatest impact beyond solar and wind that we're already investing in and quite substantially is biologically derived fuels, advanced fuels uh, that use uh, the molecules that nature created and produce new generations of fuels who have a net new, no carbon into the atmosphere. And I think we're not very far from that. There are uh, already several large-scale uh, investments. Brazil has gone pretty far down that road. Uh, so I, I think that's, that would be at the top of my list because it is imminent. We can actually begin to deploy some of that today, and the science is moving relatively fast. So that would be at the top of my list. Second, at the top of my, second on that list would be small-scale nuclear power. Today, the problem, the decision with nuclear power is it's a multi-billion dollar, uh, several decade decision. Uh, if we can have nuclear power plants that are more like 50 to 100 megawatt, and there are a number of options being developed of that sort, then that becomes, I think, the next priority, because I think we're going to need nuclear power uh, to deal with uh, the carbon issue. And then finally, nuclear fusion. Uh, and there are a number of different options. That's the, the big gamble in the future. It may lead nowhere. Uh, it, it, we may never have a practical device, um, and it may yield nothing, but if we do, then it changes the game fundamentally in the long run. So those would be at the top besides energy efficiency and existing solar and wind. Okay, so you agree with the energy efficiency, so we have three, top yeah. three. Um, so is there any other people? If I may yes. say, I, I kind of must disagree, <laughs> simply because the life cycle of technology today is between three to five years. One event in Fukushima completely redefined how we look at nuclear energy. One major blackout in the US completely redefined how we look at energy infrastructure. Smart grid was introduced. I'm just saying in the life cycle, in, in the basically this generation, we may see a number of factors that we don't know, we don't understand, we don't predict. Therefore, we really don't know what will be the generation mix moving forward. However, I like the statement here, we have to have an options. Mm -hmm. We have to have alternatives that it doesn't matter what is the one single event that will completely change the, the dynamics and transformation of the industry still gives us an option mm -hmm. 
of exploring something different. I had an opportunity to moderate one time session with Dr. Kaku, who's a visionary and futuristic. And when he was asked, you know, what was the kind of single so source of truth for energy in the future, okay. he believes in suffusion. Basically, it's a fusion from water and other things. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, it's, it's almost a moodless discussion, what's the future of energy mix, knowing that, again, if you look at the life cycle of technology, if you look at, it's not only the technology itself, but businesses itself have to transform in accordance to the, tr uh, to the technology life cycle. There are so many unknowns, but options is something that I believe is necessary in this situation. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I, I myself have been on the board, of, advisory board of the Science and Technology Council, and then the, we always discuss, you know, with the, with the limited budget to be distributed, how do we, you know, how do we divide uh, the uh, distribute this uh, limited asset uh, to the is so many uh, the variety of list of technologies, and then how to prioritize them. So I would like to ask Okada-san, you know, uh, as the government, you know, how do you make it possible to prepare the many options for the future generations so that the uh, accessibility to the energy will become available mm -hmm. and also the, we will uh, uh, address the uh, climate change uh, for the future to come. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, just i uh, like to comment beyond my uh, position in Japanese government. So I experienced various things in Silicon Valley and uh, Japanese government is not necessarily successful this kind of thing. However, uh, U.S. government, the Department of Energy, is very successful as a form of ARPA-E, which is a sort of uh, startup support. So startup companies are very active, in, especially in Silicon Valley, and they are getting a fund from venture capital. However, they need a seed money, seed fund. So in that sense, probably a mixture of seed fund and also the market force. So that kind of thing, uh, definitely the Japanese government should introduce. I think the, the demand of the market and also the force of the competition will sort out things. Okay, thank you. Well, I have um, many questions actually here, and then the, I have the liberty of choosing uh, one from so many. Um, well, there is this question actually uh, relevant to the ASEAN because we have a very distinguished panel, international panel here, I would like to share this question with all of you. Given the economic diversity among ASEAN member states, how can we ensure a more level playing field in terms of ad adoption of new technologies? Is there anybody? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I can yes, okay, given the economic diversity among ASEAN member states, how can we ensure a more, le more level playing field in terms of adoption of uh, new technologies? Well, I, I'd because like of to, the diversity. Uh, perhaps I could address that. I think the, the most critical thing for ASEAN is to get yourself connected. If you're talking about electricity supply, if each country tries and goes it alone, then it's going to really cripple the, um, the use of intermittent wind and photovoltaics and hydro. Uh, in, a strong interconnection between countries has a lot of things going for it, not just from the technological point of view. It also creates interdependence, which I think is a very good thing because it makes it much harder for countries to get annoyed with each other. They all depend on each other and that creates a, a good um, outlook for peace as well. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I think the challenge politically is profound, uh, the, the, the way you have framed it. And if you, one looks at the Mekong River, as an example, that begins in the Himalayan highlands, go through six countries, China has begun to dam it, Laos recently wanted to dam it to, to sell electricity to its neighbors. That was temporarily stopped, but it'll keep coming back. I think the conflicts over access are actually extremely difficult. And I think trying to achieve a regional grid of that sort is extremely difficult. If I were going to focus on it, it would be on carbon pricing. If there was a, a, some way to agree on carbon pricing in the region, uh, that would do, go a long way toward pushing the right technologies into the marketplace. Right. Mm. Okay, hopefully it will be, um, um, how to say, the takeaway messages for the ASEAN governments also, as well as the private sectors. I have another question which is relevant to uh, the private sector. Uh, let's see, where did it, did it go? Ah, how can energy technology developers align their strategies to the needs of the industries and users, yet remain focused on monetizing their inno innovations in order to we'll move it, in, in order to advance towards mass deployment? That's a very, uh, very. 
Yes, a uh, fair question. Uh, maybe you are in the position to answer that. Well, um, it's a very interesting question because I've been in the industry for many years and many address the same question and yet we don't see a disruptive behavior mm -hmm. until companies like Tesla comes who basically builds a gigawatt capacity factory and wants to redefine the energy storage space. Uh, we talk energy management capabilities and yet until Nest came, no one really addressed a disruptive model of how to manage energy aspect. Uh, then we have Google who gets retail and wholesale market license to do business, which means we need more disrupt, uh, disruptors in the market who really knows how to shake up all the barriers we are talking about, they are not limited by that, mm -hmm. and truly address on the customer. I remember in Philippines when we were looking at the smart meter rollout, mm -hmm. we believe that smart meter is only addressable to the, uh, the high-end population, people who can afford it. We went to the market, we did market analysis, and we found out that actually every single customer would like to have a smart meter if there is a value for money which means the mindset behind, therefore the technology development needs to be driven by, by disruption and, and understanding truly customer. Because in most of the cases we believe what customer wants, we prescribe it, and when we, we, don't, we don't really understand very often. Mm. So disruption is extremely important. And again, you have, in the last 10 years, you have companies who came to the energy space who've never been in energy. Mm -hmm. And they don't see problems the same way we do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yet they're extremely successful in, br in uh, breaking barriers on the technology adoption, mass scale, and et cetera. Right. Um, so, so the co consumers or customers also have to be uh, hard out. Um, is there any other uh, reflect on that? OK. I have another question, actually. Then you were talking a little bit about the big data thing. Um, there is this uh, very unique question coming from Singapore. What steps, oh, sorry, it moved. Okay, how do you see the importance of cybersecurity with all the data anal analytics required to move ahead? That is a very interesting question, uh, I think. Uh, I hope that some, one of the panels can answer to that. Answer I, I that. Can take that. Yes, please. So I work in a large software company where cybersecurity is a very important uh, issue to us, period. Uh, irrespective of how it affects da involves data analytics uh, and how it will affect the use of a variety of energy technologies. I think this is a, a very big challenge. Uh, once energy systems were isolated from the grid, they didn't have any real connection, they were dedicated private networks, uh, none of the controls, none of the flows were uh, grid uh, internet connected. Now more and more and more of them are, and as a result, the issues associated with potential security problems is growing. And as uh, more things get connected mm -hmm. and more, and we're looking, for example, at uh, connected automobiles. I'll be speaking at the Connected Car Summit at the LA Car Show in a few weeks. When all the cars are connected to the internet, oh. you introduce new kinds of security challenges. So what we're now seeing uh, is, I think, a whole new category of cybersecurity technology beginning to develop associated with what we call the Internet of Things. Uh, or the Internet of Everything, as uh, uh, Cisco calls it, which poses really unique problems uh, and where that technology is just really beginning to come along, but it's a huge priority for companies like ours. Thank you. Well, um, the Internet is very convenient, just like I am using, but uh, we, we, there is the security uh, to be addressed. That is, uh, uh, well, not only the energy security, but the cyber security. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, I, um, I messed up with the, uh... okay, good. Um, I have another question which is also very interesting. Um, which is more important, development of energy technologies or educating the general public or consumers about energy conservation or efficiency and sustainability? Well, there is some uh, belief that uh, the general public are not educated enough, but uh, at the same time, it is a very interesting question. Uh, I don't think this is a <laughs> <laughs> this or that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, this is, uh, you got to do both. Um, I, I think there's no question, as I mentioned, that you got to have energy technologies because we got to change, you know, change course. Uh, business as usual is not an option. But I think you will see more and more um, consumers getting involved. There's no question about it. You know, when I, when I get electricity from my utility, um, they sell it in kilowatt hours. Now, I can't explain to my mother 
what a kilowatt hour is. <laughs> you know, and they, you know, she uses that as service, as you pointed out. She cooks with it. She cleans, and you know, that's how that's how people interact. And I think there's a huge lack of transparency of how, you know, what happens to the electric system, how much you pay. I pay my utility bill, which is what, $200, $150 a month. I have no idea what I'm paying for. You know, how much is going into lighting? How much is going into, uh, into refrigeration or air conditioning? Uh, there's no breakup. And I, I think that's the awareness so that people understand where it's coming from, where it's going. Um, most of the buildings, by the way, people don't know how much energy is used for what. And I think that's the kind of thing that is very important. Having said that, though, I think you've got to realize that at the end of the day, when I look at my electricity, I just need it to work. I only care about it when it does not work. It's like my sewage system, that it, it really matters when it doesn't work. And so you've got to keep that in, uh, in mind and, and, and still be able to bring consumers into the realm because at the end of the day, all this energy and electricity is all about people. Mm -hmm. And we want to enable people to lead a better life. So that's, so, but it's not either or, it is and. But I think it's different depending on where you're talking about the world. Look, it's one thing to ask that question in New York City or in Singapore, a highly developed country where people have lots of options uh, and uh, can have a lot of maneuvering room. It's a very different question in Brazil, in Nigeria, in Sudan, in places where they're only now developing. It's a very different question in India and China, right, where the electricity grid is just hitting much of India, uh, where the growth in income is spectacular in China. So the, the question is very, very different. And I think education isn't going to make the difference. Telling people you should conserve energy in China isn't going to help. Pricing it right will help. Uh, because uh, unfortunately, in the existing industrialized world, particularly the United States, we priced it too cheaply. And as a result, we have an infrastructure and a system based on the assumption of cheap energy. And we should, in fact, price it properly. And I think people will make the right decisions in places like China and India as a result. And we don't have to exhort them to conserve if they have the right price signals. Mm. It's interesting because uh, education is, this in general, is the same. You know, unless we are challenged that we have to answer the question, we don't realize that, they, oh, okay, we, we heard about it, you know, we, we, our teacher told me about it. But unless you are in the spot to answer that question, you don't really, it doesn't really occur to you that it was useful. Yes, please. I think there is one technology, of course, that uh, gets right down everyone, a lot of people's throats, and that is um, rooftop PV. Mm -hmm. uh, photovoltaics is now on one in six rooftops in my country. Other countries are doing even better. Uh, that means that one sixth of the population has a PV panel on their roof feeding power back into the grid. And that makes people connect with actually what it is to uh, consume. They can see that their bills go down, become negative in most cases when they put a PV system on the roof because we have a lot of sunshine. And uh, then they feel really good about, about it. And um, interestingly, the amount of energy that they use overall goes down because they become more aware of energy. Right. Another point, of course, is that the billion, the one or two billion people who don't have access to electricity or very poor access to electricity uh, are, are going to go to distributed energy. It's going to be photovoltaics with um, a bit of wind and a bit of other stuff simply because it's so cheap, it's so reliable, and it's so distributed and it's so available and has a resource which is so mind-bogglingly large compared with everything else put together. Right. Can I just add one thing yes. to what, uh, what he said? This is the first time... So let me back up. The grid is about 120 years old. Mm -hmm. And the paradigm for the grid is centralized generation, long distance transmission, and then distribution for services, et cetera. For the first time in 120 years, a distributed generation source, which is solar uh, and wind, but particularly solar, is going to be cheaper than the centralized generation. Mm -hmm. This is the first time in 120 years. And I think we need to pay attention to this, that we are living through a revolution at this point, mm -hmm. that, um, and the, today's grid is not built for that. So when I talked about the second big problem, which is about uh, you know, access to Up electricity, what people don't have, the electricity grid, even if it's a local one, cannot be the same as what we have today. Mm -hmm. It has to be fundamentally different. Right. And at the same time, for the other, uh, the developed world, this is a fundamental shift that is happening which eventually could, you know, if we're looking at natural gas as a bridge to the future, well, what's the future? 
at some point it's going to be a very equal mix between solar and natural gas and hopefully some nuclear in there. Mm. Right. Well, uh, to have the options is very important, but uh, maybe eventually uh, we will benefit from all these uh, options we, we have in the one part of the world, in the rest of the, in the other part of the world too. Uh, Though, uh, you know, I, look, I think we have to look at something very hard here. If we look at Japan, right. your home country, okay, so you're abandoning nuclear power pretty close to it. You've shut down your nukes. And what has happened to your CO2 emissions? Mm. They've gone like this, right? Because you're, you're now importing an enormous amount of natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have much coal. Uh, you're abandoning the nuclear. You haven't got enough sunlight for, uh, to run the whole country on electricity. So by abandoning nuclear power, like Germany, uh, you are now, and Germany is importing nuclear power from France, dirty coal electricity from Poland, and trying to go all green, all renewables. It'll, it's going to be a very interesting experiment to see if Japan and Germany can live without central power uh, of a large scale uh, and without nuclear power. And if you succeed, then it's a lesson to the rest of the world. And if you fail, it will be a big failure for the rest of the world as well. Okay. But yeah, today, I want to agree with, uh, yes. with the first comment there, which was today there is a technology mm -hmm. that you, allows you to integrate renewable in the way that it operates as a centralized behavior in the grid operations. Mm -hmm. Technology today is not a limitation. Do we need 100% of renewable wind? That's a different question. But again, technically speaking, it's doable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have that scale yet in many areas. Mm -hmm. But again, technically, this is doable. We can today manage. In California, there's so many yeah. gigawatts of wind, mm -hmm. and that can be managed today in the integrated way to provide stable, reliable performance. Yes, there are, we have to learn how to do it. We have to be mm -hmm. more creative, but it's possible mm -hmm. today in that respect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have to correct you, your, your, uh, your com comment, that the Japan hasn't abandoned the nuclear <laughs> energy. We, uh, our government has uh, uh, defined that as the important uh, basic low energy, basic base load energy. Yeah. Right. And, and how many That's nuclear it. plants are operating today in Japan? Oh, yeah, actually, um, we're sort of suspending. So we, have, we all have uh, uh, 48 nuclear reactors, and then among them, um, two, of, two of them are now confirmed as safe. However, we had to get through the procedure. So as of now, uh, the no, no nuclear power generation is working. However, we hope uh, in the future, step by step, we'd like to re restart the nuclear power generation. And uh, I'd like to add one thing is um, um, probably, um, I think, uh, uh, the, 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 interest, uh, the, the, the important thing is, wow, well, in developed world, we have already established the power grid or vested interest, interest, interest from industries. So that's an enormous uh, sort of uh, negative inertia because in, in California, uh, they have serious issues with power generating companies like PG&E because uh, lots of homes have now, now having a solar power generation plant and they have to buy electricity from them. But by, do, by uh, 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 buying uh, this kind of solar energy from uh, individual household, PG&E just losing money. How we can do, do away with this kind of system? So in this sense, we definitely need new regulatory system or a new form of uh, yes. you know, for market formation. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing is very important as well. Okay. If I could make a point here, um, I think this discussion has been overly focused on the one billion people who are wealthy and live in northern yeah. countries in northern Asia, northern America, and northern Europe. Six out of the world's seven billion people live in the latitude range minus 45 to plus 45 degrees where they have excellent access to solar resources. And um, there the question of you know, strong seasonal variation does not apply uh, to nearly the same extent. Um, and, and really solar with wind and, and a few other things really can do the job remarkably easily compared with the perceptions that are widely held. There really has been a revolution and a lot of people have not caught up with that fact, but it'll be thrust right down their throats over the next five or 10 years. Right, good point. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the next question before we go to the ending. Um, actually, among the, uh, co uh, during the coffee break, uh, among the panelists, we, we, we had a very interesting um, um, 
article in our hand that was a new scientist. And the question was, what if we, if we were without fossil fuels? Is it possible that we actually the, uh, do produce uh, our uh, products or do to supply the services we need? That was the question. So I would like to challenge each one of the panelists. Uh, how would you answer that? What is your view about that question? Mm. Uh, who would like to take first row? First bit? Well, I'll, I'll take it on since I, I brought the, uh, uh, the article. It's a very fascinating uh, thought exercise mm. in the, the latest issue of New Scientist, asking the question, historically, suppose uh, on our planet we hadn't had any fossil fuels, right? Nothing buried, nothing hidden, no oil, no coal, and so on. Would modern society have developed, and if so, on what basis? Now, they made the argument that it would have been a hydroelectric society, that we would have developed mostly around the rivers of the world, the Great Bays, and so on. Now, if you think about the way civilizations developed, that is actually where they began for reasons of uh, transportation and so on, and of course, water-based power, water wheels, and so on, the mechanical water wheel. So as a, as a kind of conceptual idea, that was a very interesting thought. And then you go further, could you actually actually then capture enough ambient energy in a variety of ways. And they made the argument you probably couldn't get to our modern high technology civilization without, for example, the ability to generate high temperatures to produce refined metals and so on, and the electronics of the modern world and so on. So it would have been extremely difficult to get to, say, the modern photovoltaic system from, say, pure hydropower uh, if you'd had to build up on that basis. Mm. Let me add to yep. that. Let's go back in history and ask the question, when was the first oil drilled? That was Edwin Drake in Pennsylvania in 1850. I don't know if uh, Dan Jurgen is still around. He has written a book on this. So, so that's on the oil side. When was the first electricity generated for electricity use? And that was the first hydro in Niagara Falls. And and bringing the electricity to New York, mm -hmm. and Tesla building the polyphase motor and basically developing that. Now, could the electricity be done without the oil drilling? Absolutely, yes. And so I think there you have, and could windmills be used for electricity generation? Of course, they had been, windmills had been used for other things long before. Solar, on the other hand, was in, semiconductors were invented much later, and the first solar cell was created in Bell Labs in the 1950s or so, 1950s, early 60s. So that's the history. So could you have electricity economy? Absolutely, yes. Could you have transportation differently? You've got to think about this. And so the first cars that were developed were actually had electric cars that led acid batteries. The battery history goes back long, way back. 1912, it was 30% of cars. That's right. So could you have an electricity world if you did not have fossil fuel? Yes, but could it be at this scale? That we don't know. And I think that's the conclusion, at least in my few minutes that I've thought about it, that's, that's what I would see. Right. I think we would have got where we are, but a little bit later. I'm sorry? <laughs> we would have got where we are, but a little bit later. The question of fuels for planes and uh, trucks and ships would have been solved through perhaps electric-driven chemical reactions or, or thermal-driven chemical reactions. And ammonia is an obvious uh, energy vector, and there's nothing required there that you couldn't do with electricity. I find it hard to believe that airplanes could be, could be flown <laughs> without fossil fuel. The energy density that you have in fossil fuel. Um, well, airships, is, for example. I'm sorry? Airships. Yeah, that, that was their argument, airships. Airships. Yeah, we may not have planes. As I said, we'd today. be a bit slower. <laughs> oh, it's we wouldn't be at this conference if we had to live with airships. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, they, uh, that, that is becoming very intriguing. Um, to those of you who are interested, in, oh, you should uh, pick up the New Scientist. I have no, nothing to do with the New Scientist editor, but uh, it seems very intriguing question. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, we have a um, question from the floor, uh, which is about the um, CCS, actually. Um, lost track of it. Um, okay, yes. What do you think are the main impediments to deployment of CCS in Asia given the big dependence on the coal? Because uh, now we have two 
um, issues to address. One is the access to the energy, and then the another, another one is how to address the climate change in the long, longer period. But there is abundance of the coal, and then it was mentioned that the CCS is also very important to address that. Uh, but CCS availability, uh, wow, how about that? Is there anybody who is... Uh, Okay. I can give a very quick question. The problem is that wind and photovoltaics are both cheaper than any conceivable CCS. It'll never happen on a large scale, I don't think. Well, since I disagree with that, let me take up the, the alternative. I think it's a hard problem technically and geologically. I think also using CO2, on the other hand, is a very interesting option, carbon capture and use, as well as carbon capture and storage. So I think it is a critical question. I think it's very important, especially important for China. It'll become important for Indonesia. It'll become important for India. Uh, the technologies for doing this are not well developed, but we're getting close, and I think it is one of the big levers. It is one of the big levers, if we can actually pull it off. So let me expand. Effective policy to enable certain direction, in this case CCS, right. and then to provide a scale of, of certain investment. Okay. Yes. I'll, I'll disagree with Peter on this one. There is technology out there. Monoethylon amine does carbon capture. It just, it's a little expensive. It's 70 to $80 a ton. And what you really need is technologies, new chemistries, new chemical engineering to bring down the cost to about $30 a ton, in which case you, the price of carbon that people pay for enhanced oil recovery, that's it's about $35, $40 a ton, then it means a business. But I'll tell you, the quick way to get this adoption is a carbon price. Mm. The only reason we don't have CCS as a business today is there is no carbon price. Exactly. Once you get it, the right. investment will go into R&D mm -hmm. and demonstration to bring down, and you'll have scale, it'll bring down the cost, mm -hmm. and that's what you really need. Okay. Well, okay. actually, that answers the next question, which was there. What steps should business and then companies take to drive the decarbonization of the energy sector? Well, carbon price signal is important there. Oh, time is up. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, okay, so it seems that I have to close. I thought it was um, up until the quarter passed, but it seems not. Uh, Okada-san, would you like to say something? No? Okay. Um, so I am suddenly, I have to close the panel, but I hope that everybody enjoyed this panel because it was very enthusiastic discussion and exchange among the panels themselves. The today's uh, summit's um, theme is a building energy connections. I believe that this, this session, along with the previous, all the previous sessions, uh, presented the necessary building blocks uh, for the required energy connection. The future is uncertain, but certainly, I hope, it will be a promising one. So thank you very much for all for joining us, and then thank you very much to all the panels, so thank you.